We we live in, in, in the greatest country in the world. A lot of people are starting to doubt that. They're starting to doubt whether or not this is the greatest place in the world. Um, I find it fascinating that you're, you come from an immigrant family and, and you believe that it is. Why? Only in this country uh, can your wildest dreams come true. Only in this country, in the United States of America, uh, can you start with, with very little and, and, uh, and amount to very much. Only in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, Welcome. I'm Paul Johnson. I'm with The Optimistic American. I'm here with a representative from our legislature, Marcelino uh, Quiones. He is uh, an individual who has just gone into the legislature uh, in the recent past. We're going to have some fun today talking to him and hopefully talking about hope. Welcome. Hey, Paul. How are you? Thanks so much for having me. Oh, thanks for being here. We appreciate your being here. All right. Legislature. I, I want to start right with that. Uh, you have a great past. I think there are a lot of things that people are going to want to know about you or they're going to find fascinating about you. But I want to start with the legislature. Sure. Um, you know, there are a lot of people who think politics doesn't work anymore, that it's a brutal place to be. Why would you do that? So is it the pay? How much do you make uh, as a legislator? <laughs> so we're starting off with jokes tonight. <laughs> there right? we I go. See. What's That's the pay? Beautiful. What do you get paid so to be a legislator? legislators make uh, $24,000 a year, and then they do get a per diem the first 100 days of session. We're already at 80, so I've got about 20 more days of per diem, and then uh, that's going to drastically decrease. Okay, so it, so it's not the pay, definitely. It's not the pay, no. It's not the pay. All right, so why? Why would you want to do that? You know what? Um, I was in the eighth grade, and uh, I was assigned a book on John F. Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And so I read this book on President Kennedy. His assassination is, uh, was on November 22nd. My birthday was is on November 19th. Where were you when you read this book? I was at Sale Greenfield in South Phoenix. Okay. I was assigned a book, started reading it. And I started, uh, I fell in love with President Kennedy at an early age. The proximity from his uh, death day to, to my birthday struck me. Uh, I grew up Catholic, the first Catholic president. And then the more I delved into him and the more he talked about uh, doing something for others and setting our, our, our sights on the future really inspired me. And so I began to look around uh, my school and myself and, and all of a sudden I said, I could do something like that. And so I've always sort of had this 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 spirit of, of service because of, of President Kennedy and, and other individuals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the um, yeah certainly President Kennedy I think brought a lot of people into uh, the system. But you were pretty young, so the book you were reading was long after he passed. I think I was three years old when he passed, and I I literally remember watching it on television. It was it was one of those traumas in yes. American society. So as a three year old, yeah. it's the, the what was happening on television. My mom crying, the whole thing. I remember my mom was Irish, Catholic at the time. Um, now, I've become a registered independent, but you're a registered Democrat, right? I'm a registered Democrat. Um, yes, Friday, November 22nd, 1963. And okay. sometimes when you watch the clips of uh, uh, Mr. Cronkite delivering the news, it, it, you can still get a little choked up. You so can still feel it. You can still feel it. So, no, yeah, a proud Democrat. Uh, I've grown up uh, as a Democrat most of my life, been very involved in terms of getting people registered to vote, speaking to my family about the importance of voting, and then listening to candidates uh, that present an optimistic view of, of mm -hmm. what's possible here. So I always tend to go for those candidates. All right. So tell me what you do in the average day as a legislator. So the average day as a legislator, I, I, I think a lot of people think that we do a lot of talking. What I've learned is that in order to be the best kind of legislator, what I have to do is a lot of listening. So on an everyday basis, I'll meet with a lot of individuals, some who happen to be lobbyists, and they're there telling me why a particular bill would favor their particular clients. My job is to ask a lot of questions, and my job is to connect dots, and then my, my job is to also think of, uh, of, of my constituents. Uh, I serve in the new LD11, which has 230,000, 55% of those are, are Latino. And so I- Tell I me where that's located. Uh, so that includes uh, South Phoenix, uh, Levine, uh, Guadalupe, which is part of our, our Yaqui tribe, and then uh, the middle of, of downtown Phoenix up to Van Buren. Okay. And it goes as far west as 75th. Uh, with the new legislative district, I've lost the, the South Mountain uh, tribes that were previously a part. So the current district is South Phoenix, Levine, Guadalupe. Oh, I forgot to say this. Two blocks in Tempe. So I still have to say Tempe because I do have a couple of blocks in there and then downtown. Okay. And so um, you're a Democratic legislator. Tell me, do you have any 
ability to have any say in what goes on as a Democratic legislator? We do. We do. How does that happen? Explain that to me. Well, you know, one of the most important things that that rarely gets sort of uh, talked about in in politics is relationships. And so I am a part of the minority party, which means that I have to establish relationships with the majority. I have to uh, tell them what I think. And, and one of the things that I've learned early on, I've only been here since uh, December 15th, but one of the things that I've learned early on is that the less flames you throw, the better. In other words, mm-hmm. if I disagree with you, Paul, it's okay for me to disagree with you. It's a different thing for me to tell the entire world time and again why I think Paul is bad and why I disagree with Paul. I can just tell you, and uh, and because we're both human, you'll take that into consideration, and then down the line, uh, you know, you'll vote accordingly. But at the very least, uh, you'll at least know how the other – party feels about it. Do you spend time talking to the other party? All the time. Do you? All the time. I've made it a point to greet every single member of the legislature. Uh, Obviously, I engage a lot with with the Democrats, but I've made it a point to go, and and thus far, I've greeted every single member of the party, and I've Mm -hmm. been able to establish some good relationships with with members of of the opposite party because ultimately, and I've said this a, a few times, I disagree with them on policy. I disagree how Arizona should move forward. But ultimately, I think they're all good people, and Mm -hmm. I think they're trying to do their best. What wing of the Democratic Party would you say you're from, the progressive side, the liberal side, or do you you attach a side to it? I I tend to not attach a a side to it. I I, I believe that government can be a force of good. Mm -hmm. I believe that government can uh, can create programs that can enhance the quality of life for individuals. Once we start to get into other sort of sections, I think people sort of begin to pigeonhole you and then they won't listen to you because you, you've you self-identified as, as as one bracket or the other. So uh, I can be very progressive on, on certain measures. I can be very moderate on certain measures. Are you ever conservative? I can, I can be conservative. What can you be conservative on? Um, I can be conservative um, uh, in how much money we spend on, on certain projects. Uh, I, I'm, I'm conservative in, in terms of some tax cuts uh, mm-hmm. for uh, certain uh, businesses. Mm-hmm. I can tell you that. So, no, I can be conservative as well. Do you think business plays an important role in society? I think business uh, uh, goes right in hand with education, uh, with, uh, with democracy in terms of how a society functions. Uh, I think without business, uh, we wouldn't have a our quality of life. We wouldn't have individuals being able to have a, a, a roof over their heads and providing food on the table. I think business is very important. I think we should be a business-friendly uh, state. So you can see a connection between uh, the economy, business, and social programs. Absolutely. All mm-hmm. of them. All of them. Uh, prior to the legislature, I worked uh, uh, at St. Vincent de Paul and Arizona State University, but at St. Vincent de Paul, I was the director of educational outreach uh, youth outreach. And so I was also responsible for raising dollars for a scholarship. And I would engage with a lot of individuals and I would ask them to write me nice checks, not for myself, but but for the students. And and what I learned is that there's a lot of generosity out in the world. Um, those individuals had to earn that money one way or another. And mm-hmm. so they had to grow their businesses, they had to grow their enterprises, and then they were at a point where they could contribute to the causes like like a scholarship fund. Do you ever meet with business groups? Uh, I've, I've met with a few. I try to engage with uh, the local businesses only because I want to hear from them directly in terms of, of what they need. Um, I've been also uh, hitting uh, the doors lately because we're also in you know in, in uh, election season, and so you guys are always in election season. Every two <laughs> years you're running for office. Every two years, yeah. And and so I, I've had people uh, who I, I'll approach uh, who just happen to be walking down the street. I was like, hey, are you registered to vote? Yes. Well, I'm I'm your representative. I want to stay there. So would you sign my petition? And then they'll say to me, um, are you Republican or or Democrat? And I say, I'm a Democrat. And they're like, oh, no, no, no. I'm a Republican. Go business. And so I I don't want to, you know, uh, create that notion that that all Democrats think think negatively about business. Without Mm -hmm. business, we wouldn't be able to have a a quality of life. In your district, is it uh, is there any possibility that you'd have a general election opponent or is it is it probably not the elections done in the primary? We will have a, a general. Uh, there is an individual who's already filed uh, to, to, to to be, uh, you know, from from the Republican Are Party. Are the numbers close at all? Um, our, our our district tends to lean Democrat. Okay. So so uh, there will be a, Would, a primary does, does and it, then the general. Does it fit more into the competitive district, the new one that's coming up, or does it fit more into a safe district? We're a safe Democrat district. Okay. We're a safe Democrat district, but then that means that there are 
nine individuals, so ten in total, who are like, I want that seat. So yeah. uh, a lot of my work will will uh, I'll be really busy between now and August second. How's that? Yeah, yeah. We uh, <laughs> I'm I'm a big supporter of something that a number of legislators oppose, which is uh, trying to change the primary system to get rid of the parties being in control of it. But that's mainly because I think that having to compete. Democrats having to compete for Republican votes is a good thing, and Republicans having to compete for Democratic votes is a good thing. Having to, you know, you said you meet people on the street, you talk to them, uh, and sometimes they're a Republican. That's, in my opinion, you know, and being mayor, you had to talk to everybody sure. because you run in a general election. There is no Democratic primary. Right. And so when you talk to everybody, they do have an influence on how you think. Um, and so if you're meeting with business groups, it's inevitable. They'll have an, they'll have an effect on how you think. And the obvious uh, middle ground is to recognize what you already seem to recognize, which is these things are connected. They're not disconnected. It's not, are you pro-business or are you pro-social programs? You can't be pro-social programs. I'm without pro being pro Arizona. Business. Yeah. <laughs> but, pro you know, Arizona. but sometimes people can be anti-business or they can be anti-social programs. They can be binary in their approach to it. Um, the... Um, you know, to me, I've just found that one of the most important things is trying to find balance and trying to find people who are balanced. So uh, you're in the legislature. You are uh, you work. You will go talk to people who are Republicans at times to try to give them your point of view. Uh, on some issues, you're conservative. On some issues, you see yourself as liberal. Sometimes you're progressive mm -hmm. um, and you don't want to be pigeonholed. I think all those are good things. So how do you maintain that? How do you maintain that position when you're campaigning? Do people try to push you into a corner, or into a position, because they they want you to support their cause? I, I think that happens everywhere, right? And so one of the things that I've sort of really just adhered to myself is just uh, a sense of integrity. And mm -hmm. integrity is what you do when, when nobody else is watching. And so I always try to maintain integrity with myself. Uh, I'm really honest with people, so if I disagree with them, uh, I will let them know. But that's after I've listened to them, and that's after I've I've gotten their insight and, and their input. Ultimately, I have to make the decision uh, that I feel uh, will best support people. But um, but I, I just try to practice a lot of integrity. I try to listen a lot to people uh, because ultimately I think that's what a leader does. Um, I used to think, I used to think that a leader had all of the answers and that mm -hmm. somehow we raised our hand and we said, I'm a leader, so now I've got all of the answers. The older I've gotten, the more I've realized, no, Leadership is about listening. Leader mm -hmm. Leadership is about taking in different perspectives and then finding a way to create some consensus. Ultimately, nobody wants to give up everything that they have. Mm -hmm. And that can be social programs, that can be finances, that can be beliefs. Yeah. Nobody wants to give everything that they have. But if we can find a way to sort of demonstrate how we're all united uh, to sort of live a better life, I think we can make some progress yeah, there. Democracy can't survive under the thought that you know, every two people have to get their way. Right. It only survives if you find common ground. Absolutely. And uh, and finding that common ground sometimes is difficult because, at least as an individual, you also have to you have to worry about your own values and when are you giving in too much, and yet when are you not listening and giving in enough? And it's that's a tricky balance. I found being in office was more of a discovery process about myself. Yes. Than it was about anything else. Isn't that fascinating mm -hmm. that, you know, we arrive uh, uh, with these titles and in these positions of, of, of presumed power, right? And then all of a sudden you realize there's so much more I have to learn. There are mm -hmm. so many more people I have to engage with. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's been part of the process for me in these last three months. Mm -hmm. All right. So if you could wave a wand mm -hmm. um, uh, legislatively yes. and you can only get one thing done, just one thing done, where's the area that you'd make the difference? I want to get rid of the aggregate expenditure limit. Okay, uh, what is that? The aggregate expenditure limit is something that was passed in 1980. Mm -hmm. So 42 years ago, uh, there was a, a, a cap set on how much money could be spent on education per year. And ultimately, the last 42 years don't take into account inflation and the cost of educating our students. I think that is preventing us from... Um, enhancing our educational system and mm -hmm. really supporting our teachers, our staff, bringing in counselors so that there can be a wraparound service in terms of how our students receive uh, their instruction. So if I could do anything right now with a wand, mm -hmm. I would get rid of the aggregate expenditure limit so that we would not have a limit on how much money we can spend uh, on our educational system. If you could change education, how would you change it other than giving it more money? 
Well, other than, than giving them more money, um, one of the things that my first ever bill that I introduced um, did appropriate some money to the schools so that we could re uh, include uh, counselors and social workers into our schools. I think our students right now are struggling with uh, mental health. I think they don't know how to sort of approach their dreams and, and their aspirations. And so I think having uh, some guidance and some counselors there to work with our students would then enhance the, their ability to learn. Um, I also think we have to do some some programs around our schools becoming sort of their home schools so that their parents feel supported and engaged with the schools. So in addition to more financing and more money, because more money is not the, the simple answer, I think we have to get creative and I think we have to be intentional in the sorts of programs and resources that we bring to our schools so that our students feel like they're prepared to learn. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm going to suppose something. You can sure. correct me if I'm wrong. I suppose you don't see yourself as a Hispanic legislator. You see yourself as a legislator for everyone in your district. Is that fair? That's fair. I, uh, a, a long time ago, I learned something from a good mentor of mine. His name is Richard Trujillo. Mm -hmm. And Richard, for a number of times, was the only equity actor uh, in Arizona. And he used to say, I'm an actor who happens to be Latino. And mm -hmm. so I take that same approach. Mm -hmm. I'm a legislator who happens to be Latino. Mm -hmm. And how do you... Get input from other groups, from uh, from Asian, uh, African American, Anglo voters. How do you get input from them, or, or do you just do it in the normal course of business? Do you go out and meet with them? How do you try to solicit input so that you ensure that you're being balanced? Well, one of the things that I've done is um, prior to the legislature, I mentioned being with uh, St. Vincent de Paul and Arizona State University. During that trajectory, I was able to meet with a lot of individuals and really become invested in the community. And so my resources and my outreach were not geared towards one group. In the course of that time, I was able to forge a lot of relationships with multiple uh, backgrounds. So I go back to those groups. I go back to those groups. A lot of times we'll have individuals uh, visit the Capitol. So mm -hmm. I go out and, and extend a hand and exchange contact information so that I can go and, and listen to those groups. But as a whole, I think, um, I've been very active in establishing relationships uh, with multiple groups. Okay, at the legislature, what was your toughest day? One of the toughest days was, was probably last week. Uh, I got invited to go to Washington, D.C. to meet with other uh, uh, Hispanic Latino legislators from around the country. And so uh, I, was, I was scheduled to leave that day, and we had four rather controversial bills. And somehow, uh, word got out that uh, a number of us were going on this trip. And so what ended up happening is um, is that then became the story and whether we were there doing our job or not. I'll say that I did not leave, right? So I was willing to miss my flight or whatnot until every vote had been cast and after every argument had been had. But, uh, but just sort of navigating that sort of pressure from the outside, whether I was doing my who, job who or not. Who raised the pressure from the outside? Was it the other party? Was it your opponents? Was it the media? What, where did it come from? Uh, it, it, it came, from, it, it came from, from, from interest groups who just wanted to make sure that, that their interests were, were being heard and that those of us there to, to, to advocate uh, were there doing our job. So, mm -hmm. again, one of the things that, that I've learned also, Paul, is that you can't take yourself too seriously. Mm -hmm. You've got to take the work seriously, and you've got to do your research, and you've got to study it, and you've got to ask questions. But ultimately, you can't take yourself too seriously because that then just leads you to, to confusion and, and whatnot. So I listen. I listen, and, 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 and I'll make notes, and, and I'll do my best. But, but ultimately, I, I, I go back to what I said earlier in terms of that integrity. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do my best every single day, whether there's – Pressure from the outside, pressure from the inside. I'm going to do my best. Did so you I get just... any negative press from that uh, event? Um, no, I mean, um, I, 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 there were some some conversations that that happened, but but ultimately, I, I think I think one of the things that also happens is it's really simple to sort of like talk about an issue that is that can be. Uh, small in nature, and then turn it into something that that's really, really large. And and so what I've done my best of doing is 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 taking everything as it comes, and then sort of understanding that it's part of a larger process, and it's part of a larger sort of um, uh, collection. Instead of just focus, it's like reading a, a book, right? Mm -hmm. You can't just focus on one page. You've mm -hmm. got to understand that that page is part of the overall uh, book. Mm -hmm. So I'm, what I'm trying to get to is. You said that that was a bad day. You had some 
people who were, or you were catching some grief uh, from the potential trip that you were going to do. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, I, I'd been there, right? You know, it never <laughs> fails. The, the day that I left to take my family to San Diego of all places, it was 120 two degrees in Phoenix. And got the record. Yeah, E.J. Montini wrote this story about how the uh, everybody else's tires were melting into the asphalt as I was going to a <laughs> beach. And, and I can tell you, I don't regret going to the beach for one minute. But in any event, the uh, uh, you, you still catch grief, right? People get mad at you and they get upset with you. So have you gotten any bad ink so far, any bad press? Uh, so far, the ink that I've received uh, has been positive. I huh? think that the more you sort of continue to do this um that bad ink is is inevitable uh -huh. only because again it, it it it's part of the process right and so uh it, it it's one of my favorite stories is the story of Icarus right and so uh, Icarus was told you want to fly okay you you'll get some wings made out of wax uh -huh. and that's so that you don't fly too high i love that story because the 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 symbolism there is you can fly which is uh, what you want to do no, go ahead but, and fly but watch out for hubris Right. You, exactly. Mm -hmm. You can't get too high. And so it's wonderful that I've had some some good press, some some positive press. Um, when the other press comes at me, that's OK. That's mm -hmm. OK. It's it's it, it, it's all a balance. And yeah. then, of course, um, I did have a vote. I did have a vote that uh, uh, that had to do uh, with with solar. And, and and I voted a certain way. And then um I saw my first sort of uh, attack piece on on social media, and 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 the headline was you know, Rep Quinones is anti solar, so I'm I'm for solar. So I I sent the 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 picture to to uh, to my siblings. I've got a little sibling thread on on text message. I sent it to them, and one of my brothers said, uh, "Marce," that's what my siblings call me. They're like, "Marce." Why are you anti-solar? And I said, no, 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 no. That's that's the point. Like uh -huh. it's a, it's really easy to sort of turn any vote or any conversation into completely for it or completely against it, right? When it's when when it's an ongoing conversation. Okay, so, so social marketing has a huge impact <laughs> on how legislators and politicians think today. Is that fair? I think that's fair. And and do you think it's overblown? I mean, I've always wondered. Like I, I've had a number of friends who. Uh, it, it, when I was in office, it, getting Facebook wasn't really something you had to worry about because right. it didn't exist. Um, but I tell my friends all the time, turn it off. It's it's going to the same 500 people. Do you disagree with that? It's, agree it's a, with that? It's, it's a vacuum, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a vacuum. Um, I think uh, I think what happens is there seems to be like a disconnect between individuals who happen to be policymakers, individuals who happen to be legislators or, or in your case, previous mayors, previous council members, and this notion that that's all we are, that's no, this notion that that is what we are. We take our jobs very, very seriously, and we are entrusted with a lot of responsibility, and we are very privileged to be in these positions. But ultimately, I have to be a dad uh, to my daughter, um, I have to be uh, an educator to to my students. I have to I have to be a sibling to to, to my brothers and sisters, and so. Uh, but ultimately, I, I have to be Marcelino to myself, and I have to be comfortable with the things that I do or don't do. And so sometimes th that disconnect or, or or that ability to sort of see things uh, in a more complicated manner doesn't doesn't happen. And and I think that sort of recycling of of. Uh, of talking points or recycling of, of attacks or, or praises that that can also just go in a loop. So um, you came here as a uh, you came here as an immigrant to the United I States. I came here as an immigrant. Tell uh, me that story. So what happened is uh, my, my father uh, uh, would come to the U.S. back and forth. So he would work here, send some money over to my mom. And then um, I, I'm the oldest of, of five. But uh, there was three of us at the time. My mother just got tired of waiting for my dad to go back and forth. And my mother is this incredible uh, leader. My mother is this incredible person. And so uh, she she worked with my dad and was able to bring us into this country. And, and, and this is sort of where, where the new phase of, of, of our journey uh, How would, old were you? would begin. I was five. Okay. Do you remember it? I remember it. I remember. I remember. Uh, I remember uh, being there with um, 
with my uncle, uh, mi tío Manuel, uh, and my mom, and, and they took care of us. Uh, in October of 2020, I had an opportunity to go back to, to where I was born, uh, uh, and I saw my uncle. And one of the things that I always try to do, Paul, is uh, I'm a storyteller, right? By, by, by training, I'm, a, I'm an artist, I'm, I'm a playwright. And so um, I always try to sort of let people know just what their actions amount to. And so I was able to tell my uncle that, that I, I'm so grateful for him because, uh, because he took care of us with, with my mom. And, and as a result of that, uh, we've got five college degrees to, to our name. We've got a, a certificate. We've got a, uh, my little sister is a, is a junior at ASU. And so I want everybody to sort of see what their contributions to that journey were. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember that. And then I remember how did you come across? Did you just drive no, across? We, we just we 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 had some help. We had some help, and uh, and and my uncle and my mom sort of did the did the leadership of it. Um, I remember starting kindergarten mm -hmm. in San Jose, and of course I didn't know a word of English, and so um, I was uh, I was I was going to kinder. I was going to kinder, and the first parent teacher conference came up. And then the teachers, Mrs. Oyama, she told my mom that she could tell that I was a good student, but that every single time they would speak English, I would turn around and start talking to, to my neighbors. And then anytime they spoke Spanish, I would be really attentive. My mom told me that it was my responsibility to pay attention at all times. And so at that time, I told my mom, I promised that every single day when I come from school, I'm going to know a new word in English. And so that's that's how I learned English and 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 uh, and whatnot. And then, um, of course, uh, I, I, I think if you're a student, you just sort of fall in love with learning and, and you mm -hmm. want to learn and absorb as much as as possible. So um, I remember just to connect that when I was a junior in high school, I was doing my own reading and uh, and I picked up uh, Profiles and Courage by President Kennedy at the time. He was the senator when he wrote it. And I remember reading the word trepidation, and I didn't know what it was. And so I remembered being five years old and told my mom that I would learn a new word every single day. So I looked up the definition of, of trepidation and, and whatnot. So that's always been an, an ongoing sort of part of my, my background, which is trying to get better every single day, a little bit better. So at that time, it was by learning a new word, and now it's just learning a new lesson or, or a new endeavor. Mm -hmm. You know, a... Uh, uh a long time ago, I had a dinner with, uh, do you remember Pierre Salinger? Yes. So Pierre was uh, mm -hmm. John F. Kennedy's speechwriter. And mm -hmm. at this dinner, we had Tip O'Neill and uh, Ronald Reagan. and Former speaker and the president. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was after President Reagan had left office. I had been mayor for a little while. But when they, the other two left, Pierre Salinger said something to me that was really stunning. He said, uh, he said yeah, Ronald Reagan is just like John Kennedy. I said, pardon me? I I said, you know, that was a wonderful dinner. I enjoyed it. I said, but how was he like John F. Kennedy? And he said, uh, oh, he said, look, they both have this exact same outlook on life. They're positive. They believe in the future. They they have a sense of who they are. They're optimistic about where we're going. They just have a different approach in how they're getting it. And I think it's taken me until the last uh, couple of years to recognize that there is a, uh, that the difference is, is that that positive outlook can also be matched with a very negative one. Um, being able to stay on that side of optimism, regardless of what your ideology is, becomes important. So you are an immigrant. You come to the U.S., you go to school here, you learn English. When do you become a U.S. citizen? I became a U.S. citizen after, um, in 2007. In 2007. Okay. Um, I became a resident uh, a long time prior to that. But I never went through the through the paperwork of becoming a, uh, a a citizen. What was that like? Explain to me the process of what you went through to become a citizen. So again, I'd, I'd been a resident since I was a child, and then um, uh, my mother was only a resident. My father had become a, a citizen a long time prior to that, and so um, by the time my mother became a citizen, uh, the law stipulates that any children or any child of theirs who is under 18, they automatically gain uh, U.S. citizenship. By the time my mom became uh, a citizen, I was already older than 18. Okay. And so uh, at that time, I, I, had, I was already in college and whatnot, 
and and becoming a citizen was really important because I've always wanted to vote. I wanted to vote in an election, but I couldn't. And then eventually, what ended up happening is uh, the the price of the application was going to increase drastically. And so I said, Marcelino, if you're not going to do it now, then you know you're just going to keep putting it off. Like this is a good pressure point. And so um, I filled out the the application, and then uh, and then you wait some time. And you wait some time, and then of course you've got a hundred questions to to answer, and and you've got your civics information. I grew up in this country. I grew up, you know, idolizing President Kennedy, and then, you know, FDR and the New Deal. I mean, mm -hmm. and President Lincoln. Th this is this is the only country I've ever known. I'm I'm a proud Mexican because that that's my home country and and whatnot. But but the U.S. is really all I've known. So I remember when I went to actually do my test, my exam. Uh, the person that was interviewing me could could sort of tell that, right? I, I forget the questions that they asked me, but but they could sort of tell that okay, <laughs> this person is is a citizen in many ways other than than you know the the document that that proves that. And so um, for me, it was not difficult, but that's only because I had gone through my schooling here, mm -hmm. uh, became a citizen, and then um, I cast my first vote ever in the 2008 presidential election. So the first person I ever voted for uh, was President Obama. Mm -hmm. So, um, dreamers. Let's dreamers. talk about them yeah, for a let's moment. Talk about them. So, with uh, with the dreamer population, why is it so difficult for them to become citizens today? Why couldn't they just go through the same process you went through and become a citizen? Uh, because uh, it uh, th the difference there is uh, their last point of entry, their last point of entry into this country, and if their last point of entry into this country happened to have been without documents then they are forever categorized in this group where they can't advance their immigration status unless there's some federal legislation that Explain happens. to me who a dreamer is, or to uh, my sure, audience anyway. Sure, sure. So a dreamer is an individual who was brought to this country um, through no fault uh, or no responsibility of their own. They were brought into this country as an undocumented immigrant. They've lived their entire life in the United States, but because their last entry into the United States was without a visa or without a residency card or a naturalized citizenship uh, a document, they are then in, in this bucket where where they can't sort of advance their immigration status. So they can't become uh, residents and they can't become citizens. So they're living uh, their life fully U.S. citizens with the exception of, of the document that proves that. So this is the only country that they know and uh, because of President Obama's executive action in 2012, they they were able to receive a deferred action, which does which does give some of our dreamers the ability to live and work and study in the United States without fear of deportation. But again, unless the federal uh, government acts and passes comprehensive immigration reform, these individuals can only continue to renew uh, their DACA status. Yeah, I had a uh, uh, actually a family member, an in-law, who, um, because of the way that he had come across, he came here as a baby. I mean, sure. he, he was brought across as a baby. But to become a citizen, something had happened. He had to literally go back to Mexico for a year mm -hmm. to live before he could come back and become a citizen. And he he went from being, you know, a, a middle-class American, going to public schools in the typical work environment, only spoke English, had none of the other skill sets to going back to Mexico, literally living in a place where he made a few dollars a day, uh, eating, uh, you know, paying for his tortillas and a, literally a bedroll. He said that, uh, I remember he told me that when he, when his year was up and he could come back, he ran to the bus and they said, hey, you forgot all your stuff here. He says, I don't want it. <laughs> I, <just laughs> I want to go back. back home. But he, he kissed the ground when he came back. But it there was an incredible sense of unfairness to what he had to go through to become an American citizen. Well, and, and, and Paul, you know, to, to, to that same point, I, I, I think that's what happens with, with every issue, right? But particularly with immigration, uh, there seems to be this very well-believed um, piece of propaganda that, that every individual who's coming to this country in, in seek, you know, seeking a better future is somehow uh, a criminal, uh, a smuggler, a, a, a drug trafficker. And so that, that uses a, a, a paintbrush to paint this broad stroke, and that only makes the, the immigration process more difficult for people. Um, 
I can't. Um, I can tell you that that we there's been countless studies demonstrated that if we were to sort of automatically make all of these individuals who are currently in this country who have only called this country home, uh, residents and, and and citizens, the, the the economy would just you know explode because yeah. a lot of these individuals are already paying for their utilities and and their necessities on an everyday basis. So now to give them the opportunity uh, to uh, to contribute to the to the economy, um, that would do a lot of things. But again, uh, th th it's really easy to sort of paint those you know opposite sides where, well, they're all here to uh, they're just here to game the system and, and and take advantage of it. And so I think that's an unfair. Okay, approach. so your family were they were immigrants. Um, you know, did you when looking back on it, did they have any different outlook on opportunities that were here than maybe uh, people who were born in this country did? Did they have a, a greater sense of what jobs they might do or what type of opportunities and business they might create? I think um, by nature, immigrants are just really ambitious and innovative people. Mm -hmm. And I think in nature, immigrants are just really hungry people. And, and so they sort of um, understand that once they've been given this opportunity, they have to make the best of that opportunity. Um, I know that's true for both of my parents. Uh, both of my parents have just been really, really hard workers. And so they sort of instilled in us that, that work ethic. I know that other immigrants uh, come here and they sort of take advantage of the countless various opportunities that exist, and they're able to make these really worthwhile lives, not only for themselves, but for their children and, and their children's children. And so I, I think that comes just from a just from a natural hunger, mm -hmm. just from a natural hunger. I can tell you that on a personal uh, basis, I felt that the sacrifices that my parents made uh, to, to bring us to this country is something that I'll never repay, right? They made that sacrifice to, to bring us and give us these opportunities. As a result, I feel I have a, a sense of, of debt to them so that uh, I earn my degrees, I, I become a director, I, I become a member of the legislature. That's all to thank my parents for, for the sacrifices that they made. That's resulted in my daughter having these incredible opportunities but it's all but it all started with with my parents desire or, or or willingness or courage to be but but that all started with with my parents desire willingness and courage to to to, to be immigrants and, and and make us a part of the greatest country in the world um so in terms of uh looking back on it mm -hmm. your parents came here why did they come here? What was it that they liked about America that stood out to them? Why did they want to be an American citizen and not just stay in Mexico? Um, you could make a lot of money in one day here through minimum wage. You can make more money in, in this country uh, through minimum wage than you can by, by working uh, back at home. That's part of the reason why my father uh, would go back and forth, right? Because he had a family to support, and so he was able to send the the needed resources, and so th that that's part of the reason. You still feel high about being an American? Uh, myself or my, yeah, my dad? Yourself? Oh, I, I am an American in every sense of the word. But I love I, being. When I say, do you feel high about it? Do you still? I l yes, you absolutely mm -hmm. yes. And uh, the uh, and you still feel high about your children being here? Yes, of course. I mean. We, we live in, in, in the greatest country in the world. A lot of people are starting to doubt that. They're starting to doubt whether or not this is the greatest place in the world. Um, I find it fascinating that you're, you come from an immigrant family and, and you believe that it is. Why? Only in this country uh, can your wildest dreams come true. Only in this country, in the United States of America, uh, can you start with, with very little and, and, uh, and amount to very much. Only in this country. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean that our work is done. That doesn't mean what our, that our work is done. And I think that's where sometimes we get those those uh, those polar opposite responses and expressions. Um, having love and, and and admiration for our country and and believing that that we are the greatest country in the world doesn't mean that our work is done. And so I think sometimes it's really easy to sort of pigeonhole people who say we've got more work to do. We've got more work to do. And 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 sometimes people get get interpret that as 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 some individuals saying that that this is not the greatest country in the world i think both can exist at the, at the same time absolutely we can make it better there's mm -hmm. nothing wrong with wanting to make it better 
Um, there's also, you know, I, I, I do worry sometimes about the media and the groups who are paid to tell us what's wrong with society because they start to paint a very bleak picture. The challenge is to try to let people know just exactly what you just said. Hey, there are. this is a great place with a lot of good things. That doesn't mean that we don't need to keep working on ourselves. If we quit working on ourselves, it may not be a great place. Paul, um, in 2012, I was elected to serve on the Roosevelt School District Governing Board. And early on, um, I got invited to a dinner uh, with some teachers so that I could talk to them about my plans for, for the district and what I was going to do. And inevitably, uh, I was there with another uh, board member, and not three, so we weren't breaking any open meeting laws. Mm -hmm. It's just two of us. But we were at this dinner, and then um, people started talking about what was wrong with the district. And there were about eight educators there, and then another one, and then another one, and then another one. And pretty much, you know, soon after I'm, I'm having my dinner and I'm listening to just how horrible the district is, right? And one of the things that I heard is that it lacked technology. I believe that representation should be intentional and should be present. As such, I visit all of the schools. I visit, you know, I engage with my community. I, I, I don't believe that being a representative or an elected official or, or you know, is just you get the title and then you're done. No, I believe that, it, that, that it's intentional. It's on the ground. All that to say that, there was a question brought up about the technology that, that our district had. Well, I had gone to one of the schools and they were showing me the smart boards and they were telling me about everything that was going on with the district. And so I turned to one of the, the educators next to me and I said, what do you like about the district? What do you like about working here at the district? Uh, I know that this particular school has great technology. Uh, what about you? And then they started talking. And about five or 10 minutes later, they kept on talking about how great the district was. And then the, the educator that I had asked to, she looked at me and she said, I know what you just did. I knew what you just did. I didn't have to say anything after that, Paul. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my belief. That's my, th that continues to be my belief system. I've been able to take advantage of FAFSA, of scholarships, of mentorships, of countless programs. Uh, I want others to have those same opportunities so that they can – Live, live out their dreams. Um, I believe that if we continue to focus on what's wrong and what's not working, you know what, Paul? You and I are going to have to do this for about two or three hours. Or you know what? We're going to have everybody here the next month. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we'll feed them and then we'll keep going another month. If that's all we want to do, I believe that if we ask each other the right questions and we present opportunities, we can come together mm -hmm. and we can make the sort of future that we all aspire to. What people, I think, sometimes lose focus of is, is what you said in terms of President Kennedy and President uh, uh, Reagan, different parties. They both wanted the same thing. What oftentimes people lose sight of is that we're not arguing about what we want or what we need. We're just arguing about the process. We're arguing about the road and the path to get there. With that in mind, I believe that the more we spend, the more time we spend talking about the things that, that are working and how we can enhance those and how we can share those, uh, the more opportunities we'll be able to provide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, um, you know, sometimes it's a matter of priorities. I, I prioritize education right at the top, but that's because, um, you know, we talk a lot about redistribution. Mm -hmm. um, People say they don't believe in redistribution, but actually the United States redistributes more money than almost any other country. If you start really taking a look at it, single biggest way is through education. That's the way that we redistribute. We redistribute information. We redistrib redistribute knowledge. Uh, we help people move up the economic ladder, um, but they have to play a role in it. They have to do something to be able to make that work. And anything that we can do to improve that system is going to help us equalize even better. It's going to get rid of inequality even better. All right. So if you were giving advice to a young person um, who maybe wanted to follow your footsteps or, or they were trying to build a good life here or become an entrepreneur, what's the advice that you would give? Uh, the advice I would give them is, is, is something that I learned uh, in the fourth grade. Uh, I had gone to uh, uh, school from, from kinder to third grade, and then we moved to another part of the city in San Jose, California. And uh, Mr. Bernstein uh, was uh, was guiding class, and everybody was reading the story of Ramona Quimby. And uh, he called on me, and I was a fourth grader, and I didn't know how to read. 
and my peers did. And so I became really embarrassed because I was a fourth grader who didn't know how to read. And I ended up spending time with Mr. Bernstein and my parents. And then I learned the beauty of reading and literacy. Um, I then realized that I was really far behind. And so I ended up um, uh, just sort of looking at what I wanted to do. And at the time, Michael Jordan was the most popular human being in, in the whole wide world. And so I realized that I wanted to be like Mike. And so I went to the library and I picked up every single Michael Jordan book that I could find. And I read them and I read them and I read them. And I read those books for two reasons. One, I needed to practice my reading. And so the more I read the same story in a different voice, the better my reading could, could improve. Secondly, are those life lessons from Michael Jordan. And the thing I learned from Michael Jordan, and, and this is the thing I'd say to any young person, Michael Jordan did the work when nobody was watching. Michael Jordan would practice as hard as he would play in the games. So by the time the lights came on and by, by the time the audience, you know, the, the, the spectators were there, he'd already done the work. That's he, great advice. He knew where to cut. He knew where to shoot the ball. And so that's what I've tried to do. That, that's what I've tried to do. That's what I've tried to, to do my whole life. Uh, is, is reading those books and understanding those lessons and looking at the history and finding out those parallels, uh, getting a lot of mentors. Mm -hmm. So doing a lot of the work, not when in, not, not when people are, are watching me, but behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So you become a playwright. I find this fascinating. What, what did you get your degree in at college? So both of my degrees, my bachelor's uh, and my master's are both in theater from Arizona State University. Um, <laughs> I, I, I tried out for the basketball team my sophomore year. My yeah, sophomore the, books, year. the books only go so far with the Michael Jordan. Right, right, right. Yeah. I tried out for basketball, and I got cut. And then um, I'd also taken a, um, a, a drama uh, uh, class at South Mountain High School. And, uh, and when I got cut from basketball, I just started to focus all my attention in, into the theater and, and whatnot. And then I discovered Al Pacino. And just like I had become obsessed with um, – with uh with Michael Jordan, I became obsessed with Al Pacino, so I read everything that you could find about Al Pacino, and then I started to want to become Al Pacino, right? Because that's what you do. And then um, I ended up going to the university and I studied theater. And then while I started, uh, while I was studying theater, I learned the power of theater. So a lot of times people think that theater is all about uh, just glamour and you know glitz and and, and cameras and whatnot. But you realize that the power of theater is to influence thought. And you realize that the power of theater is to create dialogue. And so that really led me into this path of understanding what I could use theater for to sort of engage people in, in conversation. Additionally, of course, it gives you all of the presentational skills that you'll need, especially if you're seeking public office. Yeah, story. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, I mentor a lot of entrepreneurs, and that's one of the things that I tell them all the time. You have to master your story right. uh, because you're selling people all the time. You're selling customers. You're selling people are going to invest in your company. You're selling employees as to why they should work for you. And mastering that story matters. Now, it starts with being passionate about what it is that you're doing. But you still, even if you're passionate, you you have to figure out how to put that into words and emotions and to make other people feel as passionate about it as you do. All right, so you you go to college, you make <laughs> uh -huh. this your focus, yes. and then you become a playwright. Tell me what that means. How do you, so you graduate from college, you just write your first play, or do you go work inside a theater? What do you do? So in 2008, uh, 2006, uh, Mr. Roberto Reveles, who's one of my mentors, um, he organized one of the largest uh, marches here in Phoenix uh, for comprehensive immigration reform. And so I was, a, a June, I was, a, I was in college, and I realized my, my privilege and, and my fortune of being a college student. So I realized that I felt like I should volunteer at the event. So rather than do the march, I felt like I should volunteer. So that's what I did. I, I volunteered the event. I was picking up trash and giving water to um, thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And as I'm doing this, a number of individuals had uh, Che Guevara, the Cuban revolutionary, on their shirts. And I didn't know who he was. And so, but but I was I was struck by the fact that so many individuals had T-shirts yeah, of him. He became a cult figure, definitely. Exactly. And so um, I told myself that I wasn't going to wear the T-shirt unless I knew who he was. So I already did it with Michael Jordan. I already did it with Al Pacino. I already did it with President Kennedy. So I did it with Che Guevara. I just picked up every single book that I could find on that on that man, and I began to see the sort of um, 
confusion that existed, right? Because I, I could pick out a book and he was going to be a hero or I could pick out a book and he was going to be a villain. And there was no mm-hmm. middle ground. Mm-hmm. There was no middle ground there. So what I was really interested in doing is telling a story of a human being. So really deconstructing this myth, this icon, and presenting a human being so that the audience could interpret his life and then see themselves uh, as an educator, as a, uh, as a husband, as a wife, as a revolutionary and whatnot. And so Wait that's what now, I did. I, I've got to interrupt. Yeah. I want to come back to this point. You jump right from college to doing El Shea? No, I was okay. in college. I was in college. I was in right. college. And so um, my, my – as a – So you write this while you're in college. I write this as I'm I in see. college. It's my final – I had to I had to do a, a project to graduate from from Arizona State University with my bachelor's, uh-huh. and so I um, I had read all those books on Che, so I wanted to help deconstruct the myth and the icon, and so I wrote this play that really humanizes Che Guevara, mm-hmm. so that I present both his strengths and his flaws, but mm-hmm. just a, a a story of who he was as a human being, mm-hmm. and and not uh, sort of sensual, uh, uh, you know spending too much time on, on his strengths or too much time on, on his flaws, but just really telling the story of this what man. What is that story? The easiest way to describe it is I think it's a story of a human being who became uh, consumed with their passions and as such lost sight of what was around him. Okay. Help me on that. Help me understand that. I know a lot about Che Guevara from history, and I've, I've probably read more of the negative ones than I did the positive ones, but I read a couple on both sides. Sure. Um, I, I like that description. He became consumed with his passions so that he forgot those things that were around him. Explain that to me. I want, I want mm-hmm. more on that. So um, he's, born in, um, he's born in Rosario, Argentina in uh, 1928, and then... Um, as a teenager, took a took a motorcycle trip. Motorcycle just, diaries. Motorcycle yeah. diaries. So he sort of gets to see all of South America, mm-hmm. um, learns uh, poetry of Neruda, and starts to you know recite that poetry wherever he goes, mm-hmm. and then eventually um, uh, studies to become a doctor, leaves that his final year, and then becomes involved in what was going on in Guatemala at the time, which was uh, a coup, uh, and so. Um, He's in Guatemala, he gets arrested, and then he comes to, to Mexico. He's in Mexico in 1952, and it's there in Maria Antonieta's apartment that uh, a young, charismatic uh, Cuban uh, exile, Fidel. he meets him there, and, and they start to engage in this conversation of revolution and really looking at, at, uh, at, uh, at all of America and what's possible. Fulgencio Batista had already abused all of the election laws and, and, and election cycles in, 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 in Cuba. And so Fidel and, and Che and the other uh, Cubans talked and uh, they, they boarded La Granma and, and they went from, from Mexico City down to, to Cuba uh, doing the, the Cuban Revolution. It was all about literacy. It was all about elections. It was all about uh, sort of demonstrating what was possible. They do that. Uh, they 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 get rid of Fulgencio Batista, and then the and then the this new government takes effect, mm-hmm. and of course it's it's uh, it's looking at the at what is possible uh, through communism and and through socialism and 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 and, and you know anti imperialism and really looking at how certain countries have been uh, oppressed and taken advantage of. So they're really trying to change that. Um, in the course of that. Uh, he starts to really look at uh, at what's going on in the world and then becomes really critical of the Soviet Union. And he goes and he starts to speak out against the Soviets and, 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 and whatnot. And then he realizes that his time in Cuba had come to an end because he felt that he had taken that revolution as far as he could. And he starts looking at the world, so he starts to look for his next revolution. Eventually goes to the Congo. That becomes a complete failure. Uh, goes back to Cuba in disguise, and then eventually goes to Bolivia because he found another revolution in Bolivia. Bolivia, uh, and then gets assassinated in October of '67. Mm-hmm. All that to say that when he decides that it's time for him to leave Cuba, he has five children and a wife, and he he lost sight of what it meant to take care of his children, of what it meant to be a a husband to Aleida, 
uh, in pursuit of, of these new ambitions and passions to revolutionize the world. And so to me, that, that's an indication or, or an example of how you can get carried away with your passions to the point where you sort of lose your most important revolution, which is your family. Mm -hmm. So when you think about the negative things that he did, the, uh, I mean, the assassinations, um, the people that he killed and murdered and others, yeah, how, do you, how do you put that into a human form? I'm, I'm interested in, in how you do that. So the way I wrote my play is my play starts at the end. My play starts at the end with him getting captured, um, in, in, in Bolivia. Mm -hmm. It starts there. And then uh, he gets taken to the little school, and there's a there's a guard that comes in. And the way I wrote my play is even till the very end, Che Guevara is still trying to convert one more individual to um, to his way of the world. Mm -hmm. And so that's how the story develops. He starts to then tell that soldier, Soldier Rodriguez, how his life happened. So everything that I described to you happens in the play. Um, the uh, Rodriguez asks him, "What about all those people that you murdered? You were the supreme judge. You were the you were the judge and the jury uh, for those people that that were murdered who who happened to not be in agreement with um, uh, with with the new uh, government that was established at at the time. So that's how I sort of explain that, and that's how I let the audience know that that this idealistic individual that we're describing and learning about." also made some really atrocious decisions in terms of of life yeah they were atrocious but he was uh he was quite effective at it not in a good way but he was quite effective at the killing so okay so you write this story and mm -hmm. i love the the approach that you took to it i thought that it was fascinating um you you graduate from college it didn't produced yet is that right i produced it uh i produced it in 2000 and the first time i produced it in college i produced it by Did myself you? Uh, as a uh, as a as a graduating ASU student, I produced it. Um, I was, I think, the only college student to take my project out into the community. So uh -huh. even at an early age, you know, I was already sort of doing things <laughs> the way that I would eventually do them. So right. um, I rented a space. I charged tickets. I got press in the New Times, uh, even at that time. And then we produced it. It was sold out. There was, every, it was filled. There was people standing. It was a great. It was a great show. I did it. I was pleased with it. And then a couple of years later, I did it again in Spanish. Uh, my daughter had just been born. And then uh, Dr. Damaris Lacayo Salas said, Marcelino, as a baby present, I'm going to translate your play from, from English to Spanish. So she did that for me. And then we presented it again. And then in 2016, uh, one of my best friends, Benny Morel, I met him. He said, Marcelino, I want to produce your work. The play had just gotten published the year prior to that, 2015. And so I, he produced it for me, and we were able to get a lot of support from the community. We had a lot of sponsorships, uh, really great audiences. Again, like people showed up to the theater, and they learned about Che. And I know they did because uh, I got a few messages um, to the tune of, I had no idea he had done all this, or I had no idea this had happened. I went back after I watched the play, and I researched it, and, and I saw that. And so to me, that lets me know that as an educator, as an artist, as a playwright, I had done my job because so, I had sparked interest. So being a uh, a playwright is an awful lot like an entrepreneur, isn't it? I mean, is there any difference? You're, you're, you're producing a product. You're not getting a paycheck from anyone. Am I right? Okay. You're not getting any subsistence on the way there. <laughs> you just, you got to make it work. And then you have to worry about whether or not people actually buy tickets and come through the gate. Explain that to me. Explain the process to me. And did you, did it stress you? Did you like it? Did you love the stress? How, how did the, not just the feeling of making the play, but the feeling of being involved in that risk? How did you see it? I saw it as a blessing. Mm -hmm. I saw it as a blessing. I mean, how many individuals get to say that, that they get to produce their own product? And how many mm -hmm. individuals get to say that they were able to galvanize an entire city behind their product? And so uh, I, I, I enjoyed the process. The other thing, Paul, like uh, I don't know where it comes from, but, but I tend to enjoy and, and I tend to not sort of like get too hard on myself or feel too much petty for myself when uh, pity for myself when, when things aren't like going well. Like the, the hustle, the struggle, that's part of the journey. Did you ever worry it wasn't going to work? Oh, of course. Of course. Or, 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 or What was that like? Tell me about it. 
I think that's... You have a daughter at this point when you're worried about it working, right? I have a daughter. I have a daughter. Um, I, I think that the other thing that you worry about, most probably like an entrepreneur, is you worry whether people are going to like it or not. And you worry whether their liking of something or not is going to determine its overall success or not. Um, uh, and especially as an actor, right? Once you get on stage, was I any good? Did people like it? Did, you know, what did they think? So forth and so on. But you, what I've sort of learned to do is I put those thoughts in the back of my mind and, I, and I've just marched forward and I've just gone ahead. And then what will be, will be. Mm-hmm. You know, the, uh, uh, I've spoken to a number of, of Democratic friends about this very issue. Um, you know that feeling that we get when we watch the civil rights movements? I, I, like I said, I, I was a Democrat, I'm an independent, but that, that feeling when we look back at Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement and the strife that people were under, right? The mm-hmm. struggle that they were going through. Yes. An entrepreneur is the same thing. Mm. It's just like what you were with that playwright. The, it's the struggle of creating something, of innovating, of, of doing something that you think might be fantastic, but you're not sure. Correct. You don't know. You worry about it. You you stay up at night worrying about whether or not the ticket sales are going to happen or whether or not the actor is going to show up or whether <laughs> or not they're going to blow it when they get done to producing the product or whether you're going to get panned by the critics. That struggle and that ability to own what it is that you create, it comes from someplace that's way beyond what we know physically, in my opinion. It mm-hmm. is spiritual. Yes. It's, it, that struggle is is. When I think of entrepreneurs, when I think of the playwright, when I think of the minority community, the thing that I love about them, that, that engages me with them, is that struggle because it makes something special. It creates a spirit that is it's almost undeniable that's there. Anyway, that, that was awesome. I loved hearing the story. Of them. So I'm going to just end with this. Um, I know that we're down to our last few minutes. Your daughter, all right? Tell me about what you hope for her. What are your... What, what is it that you hope to see for her? What is it that you'd like to see her accomplish in life? What do you want to leave her? In 2017, we were in the car. She was a third grader at the time. She's now a seventh grader. She was a third grader. We were driving, and uh, I asked her casually, Mia, what, what did you do in school today? She said, Daddy, we started to read a new book. I said, what book is it? She said, Ramona Quimby. Ramona Quimby is the book that I learned how to read with in Mr. Burns, uh, Mr. Bernstein's class. So I said to Mia, Mia, do me a favor. Take out the book and please read it to me out loud. And she said, why, Daddy? I said, just read it out loud. So she took out her book, Paul, and she started to read it as a third grader. And she read the words flawlessly, beautifully. And I was crying. I started to cry because I realized that my daughter as a third grader was able to do something that I could not do as a fourth grader. And it also demonstrated for me that all of the spirituality, all of the hurdles and the hustles that I had done, all of the uh, efforts that my parents had done, they'd all, they're all demonstrated in my daughter now. And, 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 and so I cried because I felt at that moment like I'd been fulfilled. Um, I'll give you two quick, so that, that just fills my heart with joy. I'll give you two quick things. Um, <laughs> when I was a director at ASU, um, uh, I showed my daughter my card. And so she took it, and then she crossed out my name, and she wrote, she wrote her name, and then she crossed out director, and she wrote attorney. She gave it to me. I've got it in my wallet right now. She said, here you go, Daddy. My card. I said, oh, cool. <laughs> so when I joined the legislature, I gave her my card again. And she crossed out my name. She wrote down Mia. She wrote, you know, she crossed out legislator district 27 and she wrote attorney general. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I've got both cards with me <laughs> in my wallet. So my daughter is going to do some, some incredible things. Uh, and whatever those things are, I'm going to be around her to support her, to love her, to listen to her and to make sure that, that she feels supported in all that she does. I'm sure she will. Thank you. Marcelino. Thank you very much. This is Paul Johnson, the optimistic American. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, This was a wonderful show. I enjoyed it. Thank you. That was wonderful.